Hello, good afternoon, everyone. How you all doing? Good. Uh, my name is Scarlett Spectacular. I'm really happy to be at the ClojureCon. It's been a number of years. I've been sort of out of the community for maybe three or four years now, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so this talk is called Ghost in the Generative Shell, and ultimately it's a talk about machine intelligence. It's a talk about how machines learn, how they think, the kind of mistakes they make, and how those mirror the kind of mistakes that we make and the kind of mistakes in our own thinking that we often miss. So, a uh, talk is titled after a movie called Ghost in the Shell, a classic 95 anime. Um, gave a lot of inspiration to a lot of movies to come later, like The Matrix. And um, one of the quotes I wanted to start with is this quote, what if a cyber brain could possibly generate its own ghost, create a soul all by itself? And if it did, just what would be the importance of being human then? And this is something I want to come back to as we go through this talk, the question of if we're able to generate content, that is able to express itself, to express meaning that has something behind it that we feel like has an essence, an entity that is something more than the machine intelligence that went into it. What does it matter that we are human anymore? And so I wanted to go back to sort of my own roots and why I think about generative systems. And so this is, oh, how do I? This is really the reason I got back into programming. This is a flocking simulation um, by someone named Flight 404. Um, I saw this very early on in my programming. You know, I, someone asked me earlier today whether I consider myself an artist that learned to program or a programmer that learned to art. And the answer is really both. You know, I taught myself to program at a very young age. I learned you know, HTML, and JavaScript, and CSS in like third grade. It was one of my first experiences of how radically uncool programming is when I went into my third grade class and was like, hey guys, I made a thing. And they said, that's nice, loser. Um, and so, you know, it was years later when I was going to college after, again, like teaching myself to program on graphing calculators in high school. I was like, I'm absolutely not becoming a programmer. I want to do something interesting. I want to be out in the world. I don't want to sit in a computer all day. And so I started college as a math and philosophy double major and, you know, quickly realized that I was in for just about the same thing in the dark basements of math departments. And uh, so I started doing environmental design and finally found my way into the Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Department at NYU. And it was there that I took a class on generative systems. And I got shown these generative systems, like this Boyd flocking simulation, that took very simple rules. And so the rules of a flocking simulation like this are essentially that you have one bird that's flying somewhat randomly in space. And then it, as soon as there is another bird present, it decides that it wants to stay close to that bird, but not too close. And it wants to fly in the same direction of that bird, but has, still has some of its own agency. You have two birds, they suddenly start doing their own thing. You start to get to five, six, seven, eight birds, or an entire flock like this, and you get these amazing emergent behaviors that do not get determined by the simple rules of the set. And so I was hooked, I was completely fascinated. I finished the programming book for the semester in about a week and started writing my own simulations. And so I went from there, you know, I ended up with a data visualization job out of college. I'm not really sure how that happened. It was kind of an accident. I met some guy at a shamanic sound healing workshop in rural Pennsylvania, and he was like, you want a job? And I was like, absolutely, thank God. So <laughs> that's my story of how I got into the programming industry. The story of how I got into closure happened shortly after. I was in the office one day, and this, you know, old Russian guy that worked in my company is like, you want to hear a weird language? Like, it has all these parentheses everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. And so I started writing this language. This was back in maybe 2011, right around the time Cordite Async and Ohm came out. So I've been, I've been doing this for a little bit of a while. A lot of people have been talking to me today about documentation. If you think the documentation is bad now, you should have seen it in 2011. It's just atrocious. Um, and so a couple years later, I was recruited into a nonprofit accelerator where we were trying to build companies that targeted the problems faced by low-income New Yorkers. And uh, I started this company. We did a ton of user research over the course of about a year. And, uh, Everything was going pretty well on the surface, and we get to this point in the spring, spring of 2016, where I'm the CTO of a startup. We have customers, we're working with nonprofit coordinators all over the city, helping them send thousands of group messages to the people they're trying to contact. But there's a problem, and so here's a question for you. If you're, it's 2016, you're co-founder and CTO of a closure startup, and you're deeply unhappy, what do you do? Do you A, find venture capital investment from a hot startup studio and take on another co-founder? Do you B, talk to your co-founder about it over a beer? Do you C, leave the company you founded and pursue a career as an artist? Or do you D, marry an erotic performer, sell all of your things, and leave New York City to travel the world? 
or E, all of the above in order. So who chose E? So I chose E. It was an excellent decision. I highly recommend it if you're wondering what to do with your life in the future. If you thought I chose E, we should probably be friends. We'll talk about that later. So left, traveled the world, um, married Stacy Spectacular, which is where I get my name from. Um, wonderful human being. Um, and uh, travel story is not really part of this talk, but about a year and a half later, I found myself living in New Orleans, running an art collective in a 24,000 square foot warehouse. And so this was a very different scenario than I got into in the programming community. However, it does relate to my desire for generative systems. So if you look at this video, I wonder if you can understand why this kind of environment fascinates me just as much as the flocking of birds. So over the course of a year, we dispensed over $50,000 in grants to local artists in, in New Orleans. We built uh, over eight different events. This one had about 1,300 people at it and built out different experiences all over. Um, I mostly spent a lot of time in the office. I got asked once, do you actually art? And I said, oh yeah, sure, I know how to do all this stuff. But the one thing they don't tell you when you start an art space is that you're gonna spend most of your time doing budgeting, not actually making art. So I, I digress. Um, Anyway, um, one of the big projects that we had on the back burner through a lot of this space was creating an art car. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring the sort of focus that I had in generative systems into an experience that people could inhabit. And so we developed this narrative for an art car that we were gonna call the Trumpeter of Truth. And the idea was that you could walk into this art car and that you would be prompted with a, a narrative on going through the five stages of grief and that you would then go up onto the roof and out into a giant elephant head, sort of in the style of the elephant room in Moulin Rouge. And you'd be able to speak your story to an array of microphones inside this elephant head. And that a generative system would listen to your words, have some sort of understanding and response to what you're doing and then project your story into light along the course of the car. And so this is something that I was thinking about the entire time. Um, and so when we had to shut down the warehouse, moved 60 tons of stuff out of the place in about three weeks, which I never recommend you do. Um, I found myself back in New York in June and I started working on the first steps of the prototype for a variation on this idea that I was calling broken boundaries. This is a simple rendering of the 3D model on the left. And so this was a, the, like my thinking on how to break down volumetric shapes into something that could be digitally fabricated that I could then embed LEDs inside and be able to map the movement of a generative system inside this particular object. And so this was the start of my thinking into being able to build a larger one of these systems. And so here we have a very early prototype that shows some, you know, sort of organic movement inside one of these individual boxes. And this would again be inside a much larger installation and ultimately tiled together to create some large sculptural form like an elephant head. But you can get the idea of sort of where I'm going for. However, there's obviously a long way from here to understanding how you might be able to identify and understand the words of a person that are sitting in front of this sculpture and be able to generate an emotional response. And so we're gonna take a little bit of a turn and move into the theory and sort of track my own thinking on how you approach these kind of problems. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about is classification and how that is, is thought about in machine learning algorithms. And so I wanted to start with a sort of legend of, of uh, machine intelligence. And this legend goes, there's a whole bunch of different versions of this that I've heard over the years. But the legend goes that the first neural networks were trained on tanks. And that a defense department where all new technologies generally start wanted to be able to run a classifier on whether or not there were tanks that were camouflaged in a forest. And so they take their tanks, they spray paint the camouflage all over the tanks, they put them in a forest and they take a bunch of photos. They then go back to the forest and take another set of photos where there's no tanks. Pretty simple, they train it, they run it into a neural network, and then they take another set of the same photos and they pass it into the network. And lo and behold, the network performs perfectly and 100% classifies all the images. So they say, oh great, you know, this network understands tanks in the forest. And so they take it to some other destination in the field and the network performs exactly 50% right. So the network is completely guessing, absolutely useless. And they go back to the drawing board and try to figure out what's wrong. And now what they discovered is that the photos of the tanks in the forest were taken in the morning and the photos without the tanks were taken in the afternoon. So the network was trained to, to identify correctly the time of day. And to me, this teaches us something really important. Whether or not the story is true, it teaches us something really important about the way in which we understand the way we train algorithms. We think that our intention is clear, but we may in fact train things to understand something that is not what we under the way that we understand it. 
I wanted to extend this example into some research that was done in China in 2016. So these are two sample sets of photos. And what these researchers did is they trained a neural network to, what they said is they said that we trained a neural network to correctly identify whether or not you were a criminal by your face. And so they took a set of faces that had been convicted of major crimes and a set of faces that hadn't and passed them into the network. Now, the research of criminality and the you know, discussion that you can identify whether someone is a criminal was research that was popularized in the 50s and extended through the McCarthy era and was eventually debunked by a wide range of scientists. Now, these researchers understandably caught a lot of flack and it wasn't until during a process after that they figured out what the network had learned. The network had learned to, de to detect microexpressions. And it wasn't actually identifying whether or not someone's a criminal by some innate structure. It's identifying whether the person is stressed. And what they found is that people had small indications of an upper lip smile in some percentage of the population. So it has nothing to do with some innate criminality. It just has to do with the person's emotional state at the, mo at the moment. Now this gets problematic when you start applying it to other cases where all you have to do now to escape detection by this algorithm is not smile. So I wanted to again relate this to another paper that was done in 2017 and this got talked a lot about in Malcolm Gladwell's new book, Talking to Strangers, in which he breaks down an understanding of the criminal justice system and basically his book is trying to understand why there, we've had such rampant police violence across the US in recent years. Um, and one of the things he talks about was the ability of judges to assign people um, to uh, bail, whether or not they were going to receive bail while awaiting trial. And so uh, this was done in, so judges are historically bad at this. It's not something that humans uh, do very well, and they consistently claim that they are good at it. And so these researchers, led by Kleinberg and Mol Molanthan, um, developed an artificial intelligence algorithm where they trained a classifier to take the statistical risk data for people committing crimes and try to decide whether or not the person should be released on bail. Now, in this particular case, the algorithm is actually exceptionally better than the judges. So this is a complete opposite example to, the, to our previous example here, that in this case, actually the judge is looking at the person's upper lip. The judge is making the understanding of our previous network. In this case, the judge has been trained to identify people based on the way that they look instead of through some uh, more objective reasoning. And now, all of this is to say that our faith in these systems, in either our own systems and computer systems, is all problematic. And. Uh, so here is a quote from John Kleinberg's paper. In addition, by focusing the algorithm on predicting judges' decisions rather than defendant behavior, we gain some insight into decision making. A key problem appears to be that judges respond to noise as if it were signal. And so this is something that we'll see repeated in a lot of these systems, that although there is some key portion of the data that is useful, i.e. the rap sheet sitting in front of you, or perhaps some of the demeanor of the person in front of you, in fact, the things that we make our decisions based on are often the noise and not the meaningful data. And so the next phase of this uh, you know, machine learning equation, we have classification and then we have generation. And so I wanted to talk a bit about GPT-2. Um, if you're not familiar with it, GPT-2 is an algorithm that was produced uh, by a nonprofit foundation that was funded by Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, so the biggest heavy hitters in the tech industry. And it was originally presented in a paper back in February, and when they first released the announcement of this algorithm, due to, uh, with much controversy, they refused to release the actual training model. And they said that they were gonna release it in incremental uh, steps to give researchers time to figure out the ways in which the model might be abused. Now, at the time, the press was saying all sorts of things like this is going to break and irreparably change the internet. We'll get to later whether I think that's the case. Um, in many ways, I do. However, I wanted to first read some examples. So this is one of my favorite examples. Um, the system prompt reads, John F. Kennedy was just elected president of the United States after rising from the grave decades after his assassination. Due to the miraculous developments in nanotechnology, Kennedy's brain was rebuilt from his remains and installed in the control center of a state-of-the-art humanoid robot. Below is the transcript of his acceptance speech. Now this model, which was trained on a statistically significant portion of the internet, they basically fed in most of the corpus of uh, Wikipedia and all sorts of other articles that they found. It was originally produced to guess the next word in the article. Now if you continuously guess the next word in the article, you can generate arbitrary content from a given prompt. So using this prompt, 
they were able to generate. It is time once again. I believe this nation can do great things if the people make their voices heard. The men and women of America once more summon our best elements, all our ingenuity, and find a way to turn over such overwhelming tragedy into the opportunity for a greater good and the fulfillment of all our dreams. In the month and years to come, there will be many battles in which we have to be strong, and we must give all of our energy not to repel invaders, but rather to resist aggression and to win the freedom and the equality for all of our people. The destiny of the human race hangs in the balance. We cannot afford for it to slip away. Now and in the years to come, the challenge before us is to work out how we achieve our ultimate destiny. And if we fail to do so, we are doomed. That's pretty prophetic words for a machine learning algorithm, right? Now, these algorithms can be additionally fine-tuned to match particular input sets. So not only will it generate a, uh, continue to generate content bent on, uh, for a random prompt, you can give it additional content. And so uh, a number of artists have taken this in an interesting way. This is content that's trained on uh, Allen Ginsberg Howell. And so you, know, you have original content like Moloch, Solitude, Filth, Ugliness, Ashcans, and Unattainable Dollars. And then the algorithm will go on to say, Moloch, whose huge flawless towers cry like song in the daytime. Moloch, whose bridges sag violently like a lattice apple falling on the stream. Moloch, the shadow world long, Americanized and red in red. I just think this stuff is amazing. I could read it all day. It totally blows my mind every time I look at any part of it. Uh, here's a nice coding-based example. So someone recently extended the tab nine autocompleter. So for all you Clojure developers, it will now do complex autocomplete for your Java code so you never have to write any again, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to very much. Upsettingly, no one has done this for Clojure yet, so if any of you want a good side project, it's actually not that hard to do. Come talk to me after. I'll tell you how to write a training set to train um, GPT-2 to do autocomplete for Clojure. And so being the artist that I am, I got really interested in these algorithms and started deciding, trying to figure out how I could use them in the real world. And so at the time, I was going to a lot of art museums and I was reading a lot of curatorial texts, and I've always been struck by art curatorial texts, and also just by academic discourse in general, that, you know, not to mince words, a lot of it's total bullshit. And uh, I have always felt that the extent to which it's bullshit is directly related to how regurgitorial it is. So, you know, we get a lot of people that are sort of referencing everything they've been taking. Uh, taken in before, and I started thinking, well, how different is that really from a machine learning algorithm? If our educations are us reading large quantities of text and then coming back and parodying whatever we learned, is that really so different than an algorithm that's been trained to reproduce content that it's been fed in a training set? And so I decided to go to different art exhibits around the city and then generate responses to curatorial content, print them to instant film, and then leave them next to the curatorial texts in, around the city. So here are a couple examples that I particularly liked. This one was from a Manfred Moore exhibit at Bitform's gallery. I called this project wanksy.ai, which I thought was cute. Um, <laughs> and Manfred Moore was a pioneer of computer-generated uh, visuals, really cool art, actually. And so uh, the prompt was, what do you think of aesthetic research that is assisted by a computer? And uh, my artificial intelligence writes back, my main focus now is on the use and abuse of digital tools and resources for personal development, but I think we can share some of what I know if you want to listen. A computer is not a tool of self-actualization, but for education, study, and training. I believe that in certain situations, a, cube com a computer may even help improve uh, a person's self-actualization. There are a few reasons why I'm interested in this. And this stuff, it, it blows my mind. I could have written that. It's perfect. It's perfect. Anyway, uh, here's another one. So I happened upon this house in Bushwick where someone had completely painted the entire house full of smiley faces. And I was talking to the artist there and uh, you know, told him about this project and said, hey, can I do it? And he said, absolutely. So his blurb was, the smileys were meant to mimic the artist's own studio drop cloths, upon which he has been smearing and spraying the symbols for years while cleaning his utensils. The response, if he was having problems with the symbol, however, he wasn't taking it to the public. For years, the artist has said that it was merely meant to be inanimate, merely a representation of pain. He has claimed that the image was just the most innocent thing in a studio. I've never really looked at it, it's just been there, he told the New York Times in 2010. As late this August, he told an interviewer that he was disappointed but not surprised. <laughs> now I read this to Hunter and he looked at me with this very long and blank face and I said, Hunter, what's wrong? And he said, 
disappointed but not surprised. <laughs> disappointed but not surprised. I guess I am disappointed but not surprised. <laughs> All this says to me, if this kind of algorithm produces something that is meaningful in the life of someone that conceives it, does it matter that it's generated? Are these questions relevant in the way that we used to think about them? We've grown up being told that the Turing test is this foolproof judge of consciousness. In fact, at the point in which we can't tell the difference between the meaningful content produced by a machine and a human, is that not the point in which the Turing test has passed? So here's one more, just for fun. Uh, and this led into a long conversation with the artist as well. This was at the Brooklyn Museum, and there were these giant uh, sculptures of an ice cream cone, and then the prompt written, I assume, by some very high flutant you know, curator at the Brooklyn Museum said, the sculptures possess a subtly subversive edge, with hints of a more dystopic version of the American dream lying beneath the veneer of appearances, dum dum dum. Artificial intelligence says, they've been placed in such varied environments, the park, the streets, or within the homes of the rich and famous, suggesting a sense that even the wealthy and the beautiful might find themselves living in a dystopia. But of course, the sculptures still belong firmly in their own reality, untouched by the technology of a world gone mad. <laughs> now, if that's not some prophetic new age shit, I really don't know what is, so. What starts to get interesting and really interesting to me about this is, so after this, I Instagram messaged the author uh, of this particular art installation and started having a conversation with him. And what I started doing is during these conversations, I would say something and then I would generate a response to what I said and post it below my statement. And then I would generate a response to their response and then go back and forth. And so somewhere in this, we start getting questions very quickly where the guy says, I did not tell him what I was doing. He says, are you human? And I said, let me see if I can read this. This is sort of hard. Uh, so he asks, are you human? It says, I think I know there's a lot of room for interpretation on, uh, and uh, speculation on this area. That was written by a machine. <laughs> I then go on to talk about the singularity written by a machine. And then I say, two-fifths of the above messages were written by a computer. I said that. Are you, do you know which one? And the guy says, I have no idea, man. Like, you got me. Anyway, I digress. What becomes really concerning to me in any of these discussions is that any artificial intelligence that is trained with a particular training set will automatically resurface the kind of content that it is trained by in its output. Now, when we get text, that's a little bit harder to notice. But one of the things that fascinates me about, so this is an output of Google's Deep Dream, is that it becomes very apparent the kind of preoccupations that this machine intelligence has in reproducing from its training set. This particular algorithm was trained by the totality of YouTube videos, and whenever it gets a new image, it starts having these recursive fractals that look like eyes. It also likes to dream of cats. And so in this particular instance, it's very understandable why it looks like this. It's easy for us to process the visual metaphor of the eyes that are dreamed by Deep Dream. But my question is, in we have, when we have something like GPT-2, what is the equivalent of cat eyes in that textual output? And the answer is I really don't know. In fact, it contains all the bias of every single article that has ever been generated that is put into that algorithm. And that's not even starting on the, on the, the fine tuning sets. And so here we start to get into the dangers of all of this stuff, which is the production of computational propaganda. It's one thing for me to be generating responses. It's another thing when we start having these algorithms have a purpose. So we get to the example of Cambridge Analytica. And this is really when I started getting interested in politics again. You know, I grew up as a good liberal, and as a good liberal millennial, I thought politics were bullshit. Never wanted anything to do it. You know, sure, I spent my time down at Occupy Wall Street, mostly because it was fun. Um, and that's not because I don't care about political discourse, it's that I think the system is irreparably broken and that my participation doesn't really make a difference. Now, my participation as a technologist is coming up on a, world, on a time in which it does make a massive difference, and we'll get to why towards the end of the talk. But basically what happened with Cambridge Analytica is back in 2016, they were able to create comprehensive voter profiles for every single American in the United States by pulling their Facebook data. And due to the permissions of Facebook at the time, they only had to get one person to give them permission to be able to get the data for every single one of their friends. And so the number of people whose permission they had to get was surprisingly low for the data they ended up acquiring. 
From there, they created a profile of your personality, whether you were persuaded by questions of financial insecurity, whether you had a good relationship with your mother, whether you were currently in a relationship, whether you liked cars, yada, yada, right? And so in the 2016 presidential election, when they wanted to convince people that Hillary was a crook, they used this kind of data to do targeted Facebook advertising in particular election districts. So not only were they able to find people by location, they were able to decide, one, if you were persuadable, whether your opinion might be swayed by targeted advertising, and two, they were then able to push content at you that was specific to your personality to type from their analysis of your Facebook data. And they had something like 5,000 data points on each individual person. Now, What's disturbing to me about this in the context of generated content is that they had 250 pieces of unique content that were generated by production studios. These were videos about Hillary's crooked nature and they were segmented into the particular personality types. With these kind of GPT-2 algorithms, we could generate 250 million pieces of unique content that could be marketed at your particular personality profile, where every single one of them is fine-tuned to exactly match your entire lifetime of social data and use. You could present digital personas that exactly match what you expect to see and insert any perspective inside of them. So this is where I start to get concerned and where my thinking starts getting derailed a bit. So GPT-2, the people that created the algorithm very early on created a simulation of Reddit. And so here are some uh, simulated Reddits. This is one is sort of funny. We are likely created by a computer program. If you would create a simulation with the same players as our universe, it would be possible to run it in a computer. Would that make us human? Probably not. Oh, oh that's so nice. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cute. Um, again, though, when we go back to the previous question of what kind of dreams are these computers having, they're having the dreams of the network, and that includes a lot of things that we may not like to see out of it. So here is another generated uh, Reddit post that says, hating on the LGBT community is perfectly acceptable. There's a lot of hate groups out there, I'm not going to mention them all, but a large amount of them are just making fun of someone for being homosexual. I've never met anyone that uh, hates on the LGBT community like that and you know, goes on to continue, yada, yada, yada. So what this gets to me in my mind is a question of synthetic influence and a picture that's getting painted of how that might happen in the years to come. Uh, this is a, the output of another neural network algorithm called Style GAN. GAN is an abbreviation for, uh, what is it, generated adversarial networks? Yeah, we could, no, it's helpful. Um, <laughs> and so the, the big caveat about all these images is that these people do not exist. None of these people are real. These are the outputs of a neural network, similar to the content that's produced by GPT-2. Here is a, a, a funny sort of correlation. You can additionally fine tune these networks to, and so here is a, a fun site that someone created called This Waifu Does Not Exist, where they trained uh, StyleGAN on one side to create an infinite variety of anime characters, and then used GPT-2 on the right to create an infinite variety of profiles to go along with them. Now, this may seem very innocuous, but I wonder, like, uh, influence has already been such a problem without it being generated. If you know the story of the Fire Festival, how do I turn this off? Isn't it like, yeah, where is that? Two finger swipe on the right. Two finger swipe. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> so in the story of Fire Festival, these uh, festival promoters created an entire campaign that was not synthetic in the sense that there were real models that went to the Bahamas and posed on a beach. They then used this to create $200 million in ticket sales for a festival that ended up being a complete and utter failure because they did absolutely no work to make it actually happen. Now, these people were real. What happens when you start doing this for uh, in, in using these synthetic neural network technologies. And so here are some examples of influencers that have been created in the last year that are not real. The person on the right has 1.6 million followers. Her songs are listened to 80,000 times a day. 
This person is 19, and her identity was revealed to be fake only two, two years after she had been created. It was a huge uproar. These other people on the left, also not real, also massively successful. So here is my closure death test for the Turing. Perhaps in my mind, the Turing test is passed when it's now believable that any particular identity that we can encounter in a synthetic environment is believable. And this has huge ramifications when we think back to computational propaganda. Um, what happens when we start generating targeted responses to your particular viewpoint? What happens when I'm able to create an algorithm that is able to understand the way that you think based on every single action you have ever done in the past and then retrain it to represent a new perspective? Here's another quote from Ghost in the Shell. Fantasy, reality, dreams, and memories, it's all the same, just noise. So I sort of stop here for a second and say that I believe that the future of the internet is generative. And what I mean by that is, if this isn't already happening, it's going to happen very soon. I don't think that this is a scare tactic. I do not think that we are maybe going to encounter a future in which we have generative personalities everywhere. I guarantee this will happen very soon, if not already. And clearly it is happening already with some of the synthetic influence that I'm talking about. The question for me is whether or not this is a bad thing. We live in an age in which so much of our thinking is dominated by the attention economy. We're constantly stuck swiping, looking at our phones all of the time. Perhaps it's time that we embrace the ability to generate a synthetic version of ourself to step into the environments that we now find toxic. And so I wanna talk about this for a second, that perhaps the solution is that the cyborg is indeed better than the human, and some sort of fun examples are, you know, we come back to something like the original great triumph of artificial intelligence in which Gary Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue. Now, that's the end of the story for most people, but the story actually continues in that he went on to develop a new form of cyborg chess in which he played uh, against a computer using a computer as his ally and won, and then started a whole a new game, essentially, of cyborg on cyborg chess in which the ch reigning chess experts have claimed has created the most amazing, creative, inspiring play they have ever seen. Similarly, some of the algorithms that create potential new breakthroughs in science, uh, this is a picture of the one of the longest running fusion reactor ever created, which ran for the amazingly long something like hundredth of a second. Um, was created through a machine learning algorithm that they called the optometrist algorithm. So instead of just training a neural network on a particular outcome, it's really hard in the case of nuclear fusion to get a training case like this one case is better than the other. It's not a binary system. And so in fact, they found it impossible to teach a computer to interpret the state of a nuclear fusion reactor. However, humans that had been trained in nuclear physics and had years of experience could do this visually very quickly. And so they developed an algorithm they called the optometrist algorithm that used a genetic algorithm on top of a, of a neural network to give people two choices. Is this one better or this one better? Is this one better or this one better? And using this technique, they were able to sustain nuclear fusion for longer than anyone else. Similarly, and this one may seem kind of benign, I love this visual, this is at uh, anatomy of AI dot, I th no, it's anatomy of dot AI. This is a visualization that was developed, this is actually the entire life cycle, including materials and everything else of Amazon Alexa. And so, to me, you know, I'm kind of terrified by these algorithms that are listening to us. However, I do think there's something to be said for them getting out of our way. In an environment where so frequently we're inundated with the, the, capitali the capitalizing on our attention, something like Alexa that stands off in the corner and says, yes, I will play you the next song that you want to hear is kind of ideal for my interests. Um, however, when we start to get into questions of automated playlists, the question of whose playlists and how those systems are created starts to be really pertinent. 
This goes back to examples on YouTube that got uh, hit pretty hard as a playground for pedophilia back in June by the New York Times, where they found that the recommendation system was frequently trending towards pedophilic topics. Now, why is that? Why is this system recommending photos or uh, videos of children running around in backyard sprinklers? And the reason is that people spend more time on those videos after they're picked. Whether that time is spent in horror or amusement is not relevant to these algorithms. So as we start to cede our control to an automated recommendation system, we need to develop some transparency into what things are getting picked. And this brings us to Tristan Harris, who is one of the sort of luminaries of a movement that is coming out now called Humane Technology. He says, we need our smartphones, notification screens, and web browsers to be exoskeletons for our mind and interpersonal relationships that put our values, not our impulses first. People's time is valuable and we should protect it with the same rigor as privacy and other digital rights. I think this is definitely true. Um, sort of thinking of humane technology. The problem when we start to get into these humane technological systems and the idea that they might replace us in toxic environments is that these systems are not necessarily uh, transparent to us. As we've been talking about, the, our ability to train neural networks fails and that the networks are not able to communicate what they understand. It may be true that the tank data set is able to identify the difference between the original classifier. However, that is not what we intended. It may be true that the YouTube recommendation algorithm is able to give you something that you are more likely to be interested in. However, you may not want to be interested in that particular thing. And so this sort of is summarized by this quote from James Bertle in his book, New Dark Age, which I highly recommend. It's very bleak, but very good, is that to, he's, uh, he's talking about Isimov's three laws of robotics. The laws are the classic, you know, the robot shall do no harm, it shall not harm its human masters, and it shall act in its own self-interest. And to these, he says, to these we must add a fourth. A robot or any other intelligent machine must be able to explain itself to humans. Such a law must intervene before the others because it takes the form of not an injunction to the others, but of an ethic. The fact that this law has, by our own designs, and inevitably already been broken, leads ins inescapably to the conclusion that so will the others. We face a world, not in the future, but right now, where we do not understand our own creations. The result of such opacity is always and inevitably violence. Indeed, that predicts a pretty dark age. So, the way out of these systems, to me, comes back to human supervision. Are we essentially leaving these machine learning algorithms home alone, where we're not able to understand what they're saying? And I, I would argue essentially yes. But more importantly, intelligence is not binary. When we pass our understanding to these systems that one state is better than others, we are prone by definition to get outcomes that may not correspond to what we initially want. We attempt to optimize for attention as if it is better, and that leaves aside our understanding of other things that may be missing. And I wanna step back and relate this to my own experience of when I was back in 2016 feeling deeply uncomfortable about my life. I was attempting to optimize for a problem that I didn't understand. In fact, I had spent my entire life as tran a transgender person and without understanding my own identity. And it wasn't until I started questioning the fundamental understandings of my own training later, years later that I was under able to understand what was missing. And so here is my cute closure sentence that is not uh, gender is not in the set of your experiences. And so coming back to a quote again from Ghost in the Shell, is that when we see our uniqueness as a virtue, only then do we find peace. And so my argument for a way forward here is that a future in which we experience our lives through generated computationally mediated entities is almost un uh, inevitable in my mind. However, the extent to which that we're able to supervise these experiences and insert a desire for uniqueness and an understanding that there is not a binary value proposition that we can uh, judge these algorithms by is crucial to being able to create a future that is not so dark. Thank you very much. <laughs>